You know, there's those times for a pastor where you're just running along and you're running the race and you're, you're doing what you're doing and then it just all of a sudden seems like God just, just makes me sort of stop in my tracks and all of a sudden a lot of things kind of come together and we've been tracking, I think, in such an incredible way and even doing the signs of the times and all that's, that's going on. But this past week, there was a number of things that really occurred. The incredible great things of the tent revival, but also seeing uh, just God's work, and it was amazing. But then in the midst of that, there are other things that are so difficult, that are so challenging uh, for individuals, for me, for others, for us, for our community, our nation, our world. And I wanted today really just to to pause. And before we go into next Sunday, which we'll talk about our, our new ministry year a little bit, and then we'll resume our signs of the times and we'll kind of finish up with the millennial kingdom, the eternal state. I really wanted us just to pause and really center our attention on what we're going to call This We Know. In 2001, just following the attack on America at 9-11, and all this is a part of, I think, the timing of why I am where I am today, I listened to the late Reverend Billy Graham, who I have grown to appreciate more and more, as he spoke at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. I went back and I, I re-watched it this past week because it's always really stuck with me. As he reflected, uh, he mentioned that so many people were asking a question that could really be summed up with one word. And that word was, why? I so appreciated his heartfelt, simple answer as he just sort of had a way of doing. He says, I cannot tell you why. Oh, to be sure, there are general answers that could be given theologically and politically but not so much particularly or specifically. Why was my husband there on that day when he never should have been there? Why was that appointment there that day? Why did this happen on that specific time? Monday, the 13th of September, 2021, right in the middle of our North Harford community revival here at Fellowship Chapel and on the heels of just an incredible uh, Sunday. Normally, Mondays would be a day that I run in the morning. It's my normal Monday is to run and then Joanne could tell you to go and and agitate all the people at the Forest Hill Clines that I can come into contact with, give the cashiers a hard time and just be my typical me. And then I'll come home and then I would, I'll make dinner and just kind of try to be rest, renewed, relaxed. This Monday was different because we were doing the tent revival and I had an errand that I needed to run for a friend I did that, and then I came, and I thought, okay, I'm going to make my way back to the church, and I thought, I'll just swing in, which I never do on Monday, and I will run out to the, to the town, and I will take up any trash that needs to be done, and then I wouldn't have to worry about coming earlier or anything like that. As I come up, 165, I see an ambulance pass me, 
So I pull over actually right in front of the church to let the ambulance go by. Then I pull in the church. As I start to pull in the church, I see someone coming from across the way from the fire hall. I see activity. I see people out in front of the church. And I just maybe assumed that maybe one of the children had had been hurt. I just pulled right on over to the tent. I got out. I walked inside. And then Aaliyah came. And I saw Aaliyah and several children out on the um, ramp. Well, dear little Aaliyah, she came running over to me, and I just, such a precious moment. I'll never forget that with her because she looked at me, and she just said, you know, Pastor Mike, something's happened at the church. And I can't remember her exact words because I was kind of in shock because of all the activity. So I came up, and I came up the steps, And as I got to the top top of the steps, there was two women sitting on the bench, and one woman was just weeping uncontrollably, and another woman was was talking to her, and she was saying, "What, what happened, and just questions. And I just immediately put my hand on the weeping woman's shoulder, and I started praying for her. Now, what I want you to see here and to understand in part of this story and I is God's providence. I would have never been here. God had this all set out, good works before the foundation of the world. And I knew coming across the parking lot, I had, I had that nervous feeling in my stomach. But I knew that through Christ I was sufficient and I could do all things, but that didn't stop those nerves and those butterflies because I did not know. As I walked through the the door. There was police officers here. There was policemen that were pulling up. And I'm thinking there was probably seven people that were surrounding an individual man who was in the foyer who had gone into cardiac arrest. I looked there and I knew there was nothing I could do at that point. So I cut across here. I went downstairs and I was looking for Ada. And got to the bottom of the steps and saw Ada there. I went across, went straight there, right, Ada? Our dear Ada had her hands on the man's, one of the man's son's shoulders, comforting him, loving him. I sat down. We prayed together. I got up. I went back to my office because I knew there wasn't anything I was going to be able to do up here. And then I'm made a phone call, I immediately called Pam. And just a moment later, a woman came and they said, Pastor Mike, they want you upstairs. So I got up and I came upstairs and as I came upstairs, his wife who was here, the gentleman who was in cardiac arrest, she was on both knees right at his head and I knelt down beside her, put my arm around her, and I prayed. And I knew two of the EMTs, and there must have been by that time maybe 10. And they were just all surrounded. And they wanted me, I know, to come pray because they knew that he wasn't going to make it. I didn't know why they wanted me to pray, except that they wanted me to pray in a positive sense. But I prayed. I stood up very kindly and graciously. We're so blessed by these guys next door, and I know them so well. They said, uh, there's nothing we can do. We've worked on him for 30 minutes, and we're going to have to unhook the machine that they had, which was incredible, to beat his heart. They turned it off, and of course, his widow just broke down. At this point, I was on my knees next to her with my arm on her and others gathered around. And then the EMTs just kind of had done their thing and they all left. And then we sat there in the foyer and the police officers were there and the whole thing just kind of kept unfolding And she just stayed on her knees there. 
And I, in my mind, am thinking, does she want to be alone with him? Does she want me there? What does she want? And I don't know this family. But someone then said to her, and everybody was dispersing, do you want to be alone? She said, no, I do not want to be alone. I turned around, and I just sat down and took her hand. And we talked, and we prayed. And if my mind recollects, we were there about 30 minutes. It was amazing. It was like everybody was cleared out. And I think it was so, Ada, because they were getting the children out. They were getting the children out through both doors. And we, we were in there. I was in there, what, 30 minutes? And then here, probably, what, a couple of hours. And the first questions were, you know, what's happened? And then, of course, that answer kind of could come. But then it goes to a deeper question. Why? You know, just moments before, she had checked on him, and he was fine. He was sitting on the deacon's bench, and he was okay. She had gone downstairs and came back up, and there he was. And they have a number of children. He was running for school board. You've seen his name, John Rowland all over the county probably, a real big one up here. And we talked, we prayed. Most of what I was doing at that time, and I just want to encourage you guys in this way, a lot of times the best thing we can do is just be quiet and just sit there and have the ministry of presence with somebody. And We did that. And then they wanted to do some other things, and the police officers, they were incredible. And so we came in, Laura, we sat right where you are. And we pulled the chair around, and she sat, and I sat and faced her, and I held her hands. And as we talked, what really kind of came up, again, was the question, why? You see, her son's getting married in two weeks. They have, I know one child that was downstairs, I think another child that was downstairs, right? Two granddaughters, and they were downstairs. He had just, out of the goodness of his heart, he had said he would be willing to sit here and serve to protect these children with the doors locked in case anything happened in these days that we live in and churches can become under attack. So as we sat there and as that began to come up, then I said to her as we were talking, and this is kind of where I'm going to go to and I'm off of everything, But I said, you know, what I have discovered is if I ask why to questions that I cannot answer, that is a horrible place to go to. When we speculate or wonder or we we just can't figure out, and trust me, I've been there many, many times, and it's a place of anxiety, it's a place of anger, it's a place of fear, of doubt, discouragement, depression. It's a place even of possibly destruction. And I know that we're living in a day and an age of almost a lot of that, a lot of why. You know, her son comes after being contacted. He comes here, we're talking, and in God's providence, I say to him, I know exactly what you feel like because my father died in 1975 exactly the way your father died. And I was 17 years old. And he reached out and just hugged me with tears in his eyes. And where I want us to go today, 
just in a pause of all these incredible things. And I am not going to tell you anything today that you do not know. But I want to remind us of some things that are really, really important. They're important for us to remind ourselves of these things. But also, I believe they equip us to minister to other people in a very moment that we may find ourselves in. Even these moments that we are, are in now and that we are in today. Why? You know, it's in times like this, you know, why John? Why us? Why now? And I believe I'm in good company when I said to her, I cannot tell you specifically why that has occurred. But what I can do, and this is what I said to his widow, I, as one who pastorally serves Jesus, I can encourage you to focus upon the Lord Jesus and don't center on those things that you do not know, but to focus on Him and center, consider those things that you do know. And that's a choice that each one of us have. Think about what is it that we know is true? Both have consequences at the end of the road. For such a time as this, I know so many of us uh, feel it's kind of incredible where we're living, the days we're living in. I know some of us feel like Esther's in places that we are. I know I, for one, have had more questions than I have answers. I said it last Sunday. Physically, medically, this corona, I like to call it crisis because I, I just don't know. Politically, election, direction, socially, nationally, critical race theory, wokeism, cancel culture, uh, Churches sort of doing about faces and embracing things that I, I just would have never imagined would happen. And then internationally with the economy and North Korea and Russia and Iran and then Afghanistan and trying to take care of our own. I just don't know what I do not know. And I've discovered that over this last 18 months, I guess there's more that I don't know than I've ever thought that I did not know in my life. When I find myself focusing on or, and you who know me know I can do this very, very well. If I find myself obsessing, just caught up with what I don't know, it leads me to a place that I don't want to go to. Have you been to that place? Have you visited the land of what ifs or why? It makes me hopeless. Anxiety overwhelms me. I can become angry, I can become negative, and just fleshly attitudes and actions just begin to come out. Human speculation to questions that cannot be answered I'm not saying that we're not discerning you guys about what's going on, but there's a difference in being discerning and then going 
to other places. But human speculation to questions lead to doubt and despair and discouragement, as I said. But to the contrary, if we concentrate and we focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, if we run the race looking unto him that we have been commanded to do, the difference is incredible that it makes. If we really think on what we know, that God has revealed that is authoritatively true, I am strengthened. I am encouraged. I live with hope. And you know what? I'm healed. I'm healed in my soul. I think clearly. I act rightly. And my emotions tend to follow along as I make those choices. You know, the one thing that I have come through so much over going on 32 years or 33 years to start, I have just grown to know who I know. And I know he has all the answers. And he has been pleased to reveal to me, objectively, spiritually, in his word, but he knows specifically He has a plan, and I may not fully understand it, but I can trust him in it. Can I not? Because I know him. Divine revelation, when it's believed by faith, it will lead us just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in an incredibly difficult time in Daniel it will lead us to live with courage, with confidence, with conviction, and yes, with compassion. Even when we're being persecuted, even when we're facing incredible things and and lies and things that are coming at us, the power of the Holy Spirit within us, it's just as it was proclaimed that the revival is absolutely incredible. And we can't doubt that Christ is living in us. We can't doubt that He is with us. We cannot doubt that we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't doubt that we're sufficient for anything that is set before us. We cannot doubt that we have a destiny, that we're going to be with him forever with no sin. What a day that will be. But in the meantime, we have opportunities to minister and proclaim Christ like never before. With that introduction, I just want to ask you if you would pull out your Bibles or pull out your devices, whatever. We are going to go through a number of scriptures and we're just going to call this, This We Know. And by God's blessing, of his revelation by the illumination of the Holy Spirit and an accurate interpretation, I believe we're going to go away today transformed. I just want us to go away today encouraged, ready to just hear the gun go off and run out of here. Every day is a new, fresh opportunity Why do we get up with such drudgery? I know it's tough, but it's an opportunity. We don't know what God has before us. When I woke up on Monday morning, I did not know what God had planned for me. But I'll tell you what, I 
Thank God for the opportunity to love a fellow believer who did not know me that morning from, I like to say, Adam's house cat. (laughs) But to sit in a foyer with somebody that had at the most sacred moment there is, the departure of the soul from the body, and love somebody, is there anything more precious? Is it hard? Yes. But what what a blessing. And I just thought in my mind, God, Michael, made you for this moment. When Aaliyah ran out to me, I wanted to get in that silver Murano and I wanted to go home. But I knew God had something there. And every day you wake up, there's something he has for you. As new creations in Christ by grace through faith, I would say before we dive into this that it's important that we make a conscious decision and that we have that the Word of God, the Scriptures, they're our final authority in all faith and practice, whether we understand them or not. I love what Paul said to Timothy uh, in 2 Timothy. Paul's, I mean, about ready to be martyred. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, I really think that these thoughts we're going to have in the next few moments, they're equipping thoughts for you. To allow Christ to minister through you to other people in all kinds of different circumstances and to encourage your heart. So what do we know? In the light of these confusing, and and I'll use the word chaotic from Maxwell Smart. You know, (laughs) it was versus chaos. And chaos is just not what God is about. Satan is all about chaos. It's demonic. It's confusion. And so much we should be able to see clear because of who we are as new creations in Christ, because of what he's revealed to us. The crisis we're in and Make no mistake, it's a spiritual crisis. It's righteousness versus unrighteousness. It is anti-Christ values and viewpoints versus Christ values and viewpoints. It's black, it's white, it's right, it's wrong. It's challenging times that we, we live in. But I don't want us to get my, uh, all mired up in the quicksand of of it all. If we're going to build a life that's going to glorify God, it's going to be on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, correct? And it's going to be built upon what we know. With all surety. And I will stand before you today and I will say, like Paul, I believe this is with all surety the final authoritative word of God. And what he says is true. And by grace through faith, I'll live in accordance with that. And with that said, what do we know? Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28 I hope you can see some of the contrast. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over the earth, and over the creeping thing that creeps on the earth. He made man in his image and gave him dominion. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. 
male and female. Can it be any clearer? I don't know how many things or whatever, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, but I don't know. I think everybody's lost count. Male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Oh, I hope you can see there's one way to multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that that moves on the earth. It's all about God and his glory. At the Schaefer Conference one year, one of the men said, this is a doxological passage, which means it's all about God. It's all about his glory and fulfilling his plan and purpose on the earth. And it even gives us a preview of what we'll talk about with the millennial kingdom. And I love how Colossians 1 affirms this thought. It says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. He is the creator. So what we know is God created us, mankind in his image for a living, loving, eternal relationship with him. And that should minister to each and every one of us in this room, value and significance. You are important to God. You're priceless to God. Have you ever thought of yourself that way in the light of God, that you are priceless? There is not another person, Michael, that could take your place. And he loves you more than we could possibly ever think, imagine, or dream. And we were formed to manifest his glory on the face of the earth. What significance. But also Genesis 3 then leads us to the point where man makes a choice. We know we have Adam and Eve, we have the garden. In verse 11, just for time's sake, they make a choice to disobey God. And God says, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? They made a choice to disobey. Isaiah uh, 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned each one to his own way. I have liked to use that in gospel presentations. But we know really familiar, and we heard it last week, Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, we know. We know all men have chosen to live independent of God, have chosen, have sinned against Him, have fallen short of His glory and need a Savior. We know that. He has illuminated that to us. We live amongst people who do not know that. It is true but they don't know it. Another thing that we know is that God the Father loves us. One of the most familiar and yet I think one of the most profound, and I Googled it this week, what are the best known scriptures? This was number one. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Not just life in time, but a quality of life, spiritual life, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. In essence, we could say, and it was spurred out of his love. He loves you. He loves me. Carol Clough prayed today. He loves this administration. That we find ourselves now 
Do we believe that? He's not willing for any man to perish. I'm, I thank God today that he loved me. And that Christ died for me. Which leads us to Galatians 2.20. Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. Mark so incredibly spoke about that at our revival. There was a gentleman who came to our tent revival who doesn't come to a fellowship chapel. And he came up to me on the night that Mark was speaking, and on there was Galatians 2.20. He says, Pastor Mike, and I didn't know him. I just met him. He said, that's my life verse. And I showed up here tonight, and I said, well, you're going to hear some really good things on Galatians 2.20. And Mark spoke of that and how Jesus loved us. And we'll elaborate on that. He gave himself for us on the cross. He was raised the third day according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. And we know who he was, as John said. He was the word, the living word, who became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. There was no question who he was. See, we know who Jesus Christ is. But also we know that if we believe in him, that we have eternal life. If we believe in his incarnation and his perfection, his crucifixion, his resurrection, John would even say, these things I have written unto you that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing you would have life in his name. You would have a quality of life I pray each and every one of us have that spiritual quality of life that's totally different than what we had before. You see, I was dead in trespasses and sins. You guys, I'm a totally new creation and a different person following placing my faith in Jesus Christ. And it's because of Him and His life. And He freely, lovingly gave that and it is forever. We have the indwelling life of Christ by the Holy Spirit. And then on top of that, there's something else we know. John brought this up was in Matthew 28, 20, that he says that I am with you always to the end of the age. We always have his presence to be sure he is at the right hand of the majesty on high, to be sure he is ever living to intercede for us, to be sure he is the king of kings, sovereign who will come back. But he is with us. And we'll elaborate on that. He lives within us. But you have that promise. We sang it and it's on this little thing that was given to me. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I know there's times where it seems dark. We seem we're alone. And even as I was here with that widow, it was like, I may be with you, but even more important than that, Jesus Christ is with you. And he is inside of you. There may be things ahead of us that we may feel very alone. There may be many brothers and sisters in Afghanistan that are new creations in Christ that are being tortured and persecuted in cells by themselves as they have been all over the world. But they have a promise. Christ is in them, but Christ is, is with them. And he's never forsaking them. We know. We know he is with us. And we build on that foundation. And he's promised he'll never leave us or forsake us. And to come back to Galatians 2.20, 
Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. When I was sitting next to Mark, he turned to me and looked at me and he looked at you and he said, basically, I can never get over that. And I've said that so many times. Can you believe Jesus Christ is alive inside of you right here, right now, if you're a new creation in Christ? Do you believe that? Yes? No? Thank you. (laughs) Yes. A thousand times yes. Yes. A million times, yes. He is alive. And He is alive in you. And He is wanting to live His life in you. He's wanting to do with you, through you, more than you could ever think, imagine, or dream. If we have the faith to believe and identify with Him, And His resurrection life that lives within us. Look at the Apostle Paul's life. Do you think he did that in his own fleshly strength? It was through the person of Christ who did what Paul could have never done in his own strength. I was reminded of Colossians 1, 27 to 29. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. This thing that was previously unrevealed, which is what? Christ in you. The hope of glory. Hope is integrated with Christ and Him living inside of us. Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor. I labor, and that means I strive to to exhaustion. According to His working which works in me mightily. Don't miss all that's being said there. The Apostle Paul is preaching and proclaiming and pointing people to Christ, but it is Christ in him and his mighty power by the Holy Spirit that is doing that work in him and through him. And beloved ones, this striving here means exhaustion. God works through our mortal body sometimes that we are exhausted. We can get tired. And I want to ask you to pray for me. I've had loss. I've had things happen. I know it may not mean a lot to everybody, but I know it does to Sandra and some of the others. I'm Sharon, I know it does you. I had to put my dog down this week. In the midst of a revival of outside in the foyer. Over all this time of craziness Politically, and I will stand on it's crazy. There's no sanity. It's insanity. Just, just come visit me. But I, I, I know that he has a plan, and he's working, and he's willing, and he's doing. And I see it. And I see it in you guys. I want us to remember something else and know this. 
You have the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ said, because he had risen, if I go to my father, I'm going to send another one or another, a comforter. And he said, you'll receive power. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. Power is not something. Power is a person. It is the Holy Spirit of God working in you, doing through you. Romans 8 speaks about that in such a powerful way. Acts obviously introduces it, and Paul builds upon it. But we know that. You know it. I know it. Another thing we know is this. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes. We know God is sovereign. We know, Pauli, there are no maverick molecules. We know that God didn't have His back turned last week when John collapsed in our foyer. We know God is all wise. We know God is working everything out after the counsel of His own will. We know from this passage He's orchestrating everything together, piecing it together perfectly. When we sang How Firm a Foundation, that was a woman in our church's uh, name was Diane Tecklenburg. That was her favorite hymn. And Diane Tecklenburg would say so many times as we were running the race, she would just say, Michael, I'm just trusting God's heart and I cannot trace His hand. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not your own understanding in all your ways. He's going to direct your path. For her, her path was directed into His very presence. She told me days before she died, she said, Michael, I know when I get to heaven, I'm going to look in the eyes of Jesus and I'm going to say, your plan was perfect. Wow. Leaving grandchildren, not being able to see them marry and go on. But what an incredible expression of faith and knowing And beloved ones, I know there's a lot of things that are going on that we wouldn't want, that we wouldn't choose personally, nationally, every other way. But if we falter in what we know is true, that's what we're accountable for. I'm not going to answer for what these other people do and what their decisions are. But I will, as we said, and what's going to lead us to, is I will be before Him for myself. Incredible, incredible thought. He's working everything for our benefit. 2 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that Thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Christ lives not only in us, but he is making manifest his life through us. And that life is in words, that life is in deeds. And that life also could be in silence. But isn't it incredible to know that wherever you're going, Terry, you're on a mission. You are just living your life. And Christ is wanting to work through us who are yielded to him as instruments of righteousness who may use words, who may not use words, or may be somebody that somebody sees and says, wow, that was just somebody that was so different. And God uses that in an incredible way. An incredible climactic thing that we know is John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. 
You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Is there a better promise? I'm going, but I'm coming back. And you're going to be with me forever, face to face. Always. We can't even begin to comprehend that. Oh, the winds may be blowing. The storms can be going crazy around us. But we know what we know. And can't we see in our troubles that he's encouraging us? I've got a place for you. I've got a destiny. And it's surer than these words in black and white on this piece of paper in front of me that it'll occur. And his presence is accompanied by the throne of grace, God, our heavenly Father, believers, worship and praise. 2 Corinthians 5.10 is another thing we know. We just recently talked about it, that we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We know that. So that affects how we live now. But also, beloved ones, we know We know, and we're going to talk about this when we resume our signs of the times, there is a coming millennial kingdom. A 1,000-year reign from Revelation 20 that we will reign with Jesus Christ on the face of the earth. Can you believe that? And we're going to come back with him prior to that. And in a lot of ways, all we're going through right now is training for what our roles are going to be in the millennial kingdom. I don't want to be one that just barely gets in by the skin of my teeth. I want to be one that through Christ and by His Spirit, I'm faithful to what He calls me to. That I run up the steps of the church in the midst of of danger or the midst of something I don't know what it is. I want to be one that can give an account that I was faithful to you, to Christ, to whom he had entrusted to me. And now's the time. And then we'll talk about Revelation 21 and 22 where... I don't even think we can think or we can't imagine, we can't even begin to imagine what the eternal state will be like. The new heaven, the new earth, no sorrow, no pain, new resurrection bodies, spiritual bodies, communication, no sin, face to face with Jesus Christ, seeing our loved ones that have gone. I I mean, we could go on and on. I just don't think we could ever even put it in words, and I think that's why we don't even have a whole lot there. The Apostle Paul couldn't even, though he got a glimpse, he couldn't even see it and necessarily uh, speak of it. I saw over the weekend many signs. I know you saw them too. Never forget 9-11-01. And we saw them in many different ways, didn't we? We knew what happened. We knew it was true. You see, God has revealed to us with all authority in His Word what is true. Jesus is the truth. And the revelation of God is the truth. And he has enlightened us to it. He has illuminated us to it. And I just want to say these couple of things in our response as new creations in Jesus Christ by grace through faith. 
Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God and what he says is true. When he tells you that you're worthless and that you're a nothing, don't believe that lie. It is deception. You are priceless. When he tells you that God can't know what he's doing by this or that or whatever. You just go right back that he is orchestrating everything after the counsel of his own will for your spiritual benefit and for his glory and surrender to his wisdom and his knowledge and his understanding. And also Paul says, you think on those things. Don't let yourself, and let me just read what he says there. He says in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever are noble, whatever are just, whatever are pure, whatever are lovely, whatever is of good report, if there's any virtue, anything praiseworthy, meditate upon these things. Think on those things. John used a good word. When he spoke to us, he said, don't get distracted. It doesn't mean that we're not aware. It doesn't mean that we're not discerning. It doesn't mean any of the things that we believe in our actions or whatever. But don't be distracted. We have a singular focus is upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We're becoming ever increasingly conformed to Him as we see Him. And I just want to close by saying this. Never forget to forget or not forget what you know is true. Never forget to not forget to know what you know is true. We thank you so much, Father, that you loved us so much that not only did you reveal your Son to us, not only did he give his life for us, not only is he with us, not only is he living in us, not only is he manifesting himself through us, not only is he coming back for us, for us to be with him forever, you also have equipped us with the word of God. You are training us so that we would live in righteousness and we would bring glory and honor and praise to you in every way. I pray that this message falls deep within the seed of our hearts and bears fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. May we remember these grand and glorious truths. May we outlive them by the power of the Holy Spirit. May we stand firm. May we be lights. Spiritual illuminaries in a dark world. And where we have to take a stand, may we unashamedly take that stand. But we confess we need your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom as we navigate these days even for those who personally are running races, losing loved ones, others of us who are living in days with loss or just trying to discern your will for our church, our community, and our nation, and our world. I thank you that as Jen Trimble told me as we started 18 months ago, God's got this. You've got it. And we knew in a fresh surrender as living sacrifices for you to work through and for you to bring about your glory right here, now, and forevermore, we pray. And it's in the name of Jesus 
that the church prays, saying together, Amen. Well, I want to close with an incredible, encouraging passage of Scripture from Romans 8. So would you stand with me? And to me, this is a great victorious way for us to leave today running out, encouraged, strengthened, running the race, equipped that God has set before us. After speaking of all kinds of things and being conformed in the image of Christ and all this stuff Paul says, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Guys, do we believe that? We need to act like it. We need to live like it. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You have all things, right, Ronnie? Pertaining to life and godliness. You got everything you need. You got Christ. You got the Holy Spirit. What more do you need in the spiritual realm? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore also is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God and who makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? We're facing it or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or peril, or sword. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. You are more than a conqueror through Christ and by the Holy Spirit. For I am persuaded, I know, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things present, nor things present, nor people present, nor things to come, no height or depth or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be the glory now and forevermore. And we all say, Amen. Amen. We're dismissed, everybody. I love you guys. Mm -hmm.